So um, I think we can go ahead and get started. So we are um, extremely fortunate today to be joined by Dr. Jawahar. Um, Dr. Jawahar is uh, currently an assistant professor and abdominal radiologist at Northwestern University. She uh, started her training at Loyola, Loyola University, where she did her residency in Chicago, and then went on to do a body MRI fellowship at Stanford. Um, her primary interests are in GU and gynonc imaging, and I think we're really going to benefit from uh, her expertise in that today. I know I'm personally extremely excited about this talk. And in addition, she also has um, interest in particular with teaching methods and kind of novel educational models and is one of the um, faculty in the leadership team for Rad Expo. Um, we are delighted to have her today here with us. She um, is a recipient of the AUR APDR Radiology Career Advancement Lectureship Program, which is quite a mouthful, um, but basically it gives her the opportunity to come and talk to us. Um, as a kind of function of that, I'm going to put a, a survey in the chat now and then at the end of the uh, discussion to gather some feedback for her about her talk today. Um, and everyone is welcome to uh, participate in that feedback survey. Because of the way that this Grand Rounds is being run, we won't be able to unmute people for questions, but I would really encourage people to participate and um, gather questions if you have any. And you can either type those in the chat or use the QA function at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and then we will go through those at the end of uh, Dr. Jawahar's talk. Okay, without further ado, um, you can go ahead and get started. Thank you, Dr. Griffith, for the introduction. And uh, thanks to everyone at uh, University of Utah who has been very kind and accommodating me in a short time and have been very um, receptive of everything that I've asked for. Thank you. I'm going to share the screen. Can you see my screen? We can. It looks great. Perfect. Um, let me see if I can minimize. Um, is this the one that I have typed? But anyways, um, so good afternoon, everyone, um, to all the residents and fellows and faculty. Thank you for taking the time to listen um, to this Grand Rounds lecture. And this is part of the AUR APDR RCALP uh, program. And um, I just wanted to choose a topic that might be useful. Um, that's not like totally um, radiology, like core radiology uh, information, but it's also something that's related to patient care, which we are directly and indirectly um, catering to. So this is about the role of radiologists in adding value to patient care at GU tumor boards. And I have a bunch of cases um, that, um, sorry, can I? Okay, a bunch of cases to show like what shows up on the tumor board, which we really don't discuss at, um, during our workstation teaching. I do not have any disclosures. So what we're gonna to cover today is like the, how was the GU tumor board set up for the earlier residents, like the first and second years who have not gone to a tumor board yet. Um, emphasis on the role of radiologists at the tumor board and what are the benefits for the radiologists at the tumor board and some simulated cases which I kind of encountered during the tumor boards and emphasis on some practical points with some learning material so that you get something out of this lecture. So the multidisciplinary tumor board is a team approach um, for the patient's uh, improved care. And as I, you see, like first the patient gets seen by one of the urologists, and then you get to meet the whole host of uh, experts, which kind of includes, um, I just included the most uh, common ones. And there are other uh, important people like the physiotherapist and other ancillary care, uh, which I have not put in this um, flow chart. So you have a surgeon, medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, pathologist, and uh, radi uh, radiologist, and nuclear medicine physician who form the core team. Uh, what a core team means is like they must personally attend at least two to two out of three uh, multidisciplinary tumor board conferences if they are presenting at them. And um, you would have, uh, if you've listened to like rectal cancer, tum um, the GI tumor boards, um, this is emphasized at the SAR as well. And the other one, other people like the social worker, palliative care, and the genetic counselors are all non-core team, but they are also play, play a very important role. 
Um, just wanted to kind of uh, emphasis like from literature review why uh, this talk talk is important. Um, and then these are like some articles, uh, not much in literature about what's why radiology is important, but like whatever has been in the literature is kind of uh, reassuring why we are important. So this is an article from the European Radiology uh, in 2021. They did a survey and did a questionnaire and they and they did a analysis and they found the perceived benefits by the radiologists, what radiologists feel is benefiting to them is they, uh, most of them felt they have better surgical and histological feedback, improved knowledge of the cancer treatment because uh, directly or indirectly our reports do have to, we, we do need, need to have the knowledge of the improved or the new cancer treatments to know whether it's progression of disease or a pseudo progression of disease. Like for example, if it's an immunotherapy patients, um, pseudo progression where like the tumor can increase in size, but then like regresses after a few treatments is a known entity and having to know about that uh, fact that the pseudo progression is common in immunotherapy um, is important when we are reporting them. We don't want to call it as a progression when it's actually not a, a true progression. And they also felt there is better interaction between radiologists and referring physicians for discussing any rare cases. Um, uh, they also have looked at the issues or the deficiencies of the tumor boards. They felt it's like attending tumor boards during regular working hours is kind of difficult, especially when it's like, like 9 to 10 or during the work hours, or if it's like after work hours. Uh, or and lack of accreditation with CME benefits. Most of the larger institutions have CME benefits, but small institutions, if they're not adding to the learning process, they might not have. It's a lot of paperwork, so I don't know why they kind of don't do it, but like it's definitely a learning process in the tumor boards. So those are kind of detriment for some people who are doing the tumor boards. This is another paper um, in Global Oncology in 2015. Um, they uh, found like this was a survey for everybody, radiologists, surgeons, oncologists, and they felt like radiologists help change the treatment plans in one to 25% of the times, which is a good big number. And 25 to 30% of the time, they helped in changing the type of surgery, whether it's like a um, focal excision or like a radical surgery. Uh, it was based on radiology's um, expertise. And 96% of the respondents uh, mentioned that, which included the radiologists, they said like the overall benefit to the patients was worth the time taken to do these multidisciplinary conferences. There's another survey done in UK. I'm just going to like, apart from the patient outcomes and other things, which was emphasized on the other two papers, it also helps with um, educational opportunities for our health professionals, support from a collegial environment and improve job satisfaction, which I highly emphasize because when we kind of, um, we know our reports do make a change, but when you're directly inter interacting with your clinicians and knowing our um, our opinion makes changes in the patient treatment and we are towards better care of the patient, it definitely gives an increased job satisfaction. So kind of summing it up, importance of multidisciplinary tumor board is for collaboration, timely and correct diagnosis and improved patient outcomes. And radiologist's role is for expert image interpretation, accurate and right diagnoses and guiding the management. So I'm gonna give you some examples of whatever we have emphasized, like how we improve patient outcomes in the tumor boards. So this is, sorry, I'm gonna bring it down if possible, sorry, okay. Um, so this is a 76 year old male with history of uh, renal transplant twice. Uh, he had a renal transplant one, failed another transplant. And then he had 13 years prior, he had a right nephrectomy for a clear solar CC. So now this patient was presenting with proteinuria. So as you can see on the coronal images, if there are first and second years, the left two images are the coronal CT images and the right image, uh, which I'm showing with a pointer is the MR uh, T2 weighted image. So you can see like uh, this patient, the current one is from like the seven months prior, we are kind of looking at the tumor. I have another slide which shows the most recent one. So five years back, looking back, um, this patient had an atrophic, as we know, like this had an ESRD, so it has an atrophic kidney. And then two years prior, you can see there was some fullness at the pelvic aetosial system. Um, and this was not actually reported as the outside study. And then patient comes back with this um, seven months prior, you can see it is enlarged, um, dysmorphic kidney, some solid tissue that's uh, involving the cortex extending to the pelvic aetosial system. So they biopsied this, it came back as a low-grade urothelial cancer. 
so this sorry. And uh, after this is another image showing this is a ADC uh, image on the in the middle, which shows the restricted diffusion in that solid portions of the tumor. And uh, this was a uh, retrograde uh, uh, uretroscopy and like constant contrast showing like distorted pelvic helical system in the upper pole. Uh, so this patient was discussed about like because he had a very low grade papillary urothelial carcinoma. They were debating about like should we do chemotherapy or a BCG um, a treatment um, because he had a low grade. They were uh, decided not to go for chemotherapy. And immunotherapy was another thing that was considered, um, but uh, it was not started because when patients who have renal transplant go on immunotherapy, they have um, it's data proven that there is 40% rejection rates in those patients for transplant. So they were kind of debating. So in this meantime, the patient returned later. So they were kind of following it up. And then, um, sorry. Um, so this is, I'm trying to show um, the AUA, which is the American Urology Association. Uh, this is their guidelines for upper urinary tract carcinomas. So what you do in these kind of tumors for this patient as well, the first the option they give is like uh, tumor ablation for low risk favorable tumors. And it's given as an option for unfavorable uh, low risk tumors or a selected high risk favorable tumors. And uh, what they do is after tumor ablation, they kind of give an intravesicle or a pelvic adhesial chemotherapy because of the association of upper tract ur urothelial cancer with the lower tract, which is the bladder tumors is high. So they kind of do this uh, chemotherapy to re reduce the risk of recurrence in these patients. And radical nephroureterectomy, which you will see in a lot of patients, is done if the tumor ablation is not feasible. But if it's a very low grade and a focal tumor, tumor ablation followed by uh, chemotherapy is of choice. So this was all in the discussion of the patient and the patient was not started on therapy. So that when the patient came back, like a few months later, patient had a repeat imaging before they finalized on the treatment. And this was also an outside study. So you can see seven months prior on the MR urography, the bladder was looking fine. And the current study, you can see there was an irregular thickening of the wall and it was also extending beyond the uh, wall of the bladder. And unfortunately, this was not called for in the outside imaging. And in the tumor board, we discussed and we mentioned like this is something that was not seen before and uh, highly suspicious for a urothelial cancer. So now this changes the whole treatment plan because according to AUA's uh, guidelines for bladder cancer, um, they start they treat the patient with neoadjuvant chemotherapy and in preparation for the radical cystectomy for the non-metastatic muscle invasive tumors. And uh, when they do a radical cystectomy, they ideally do bilateral pelvic lymphadenectomy and also reproductive organ removal, depending on whether they want to preserve the organs um, and the uh, bladder, de um, depending on the patient's preference as well, and also the other factors of high grade or low grade tumors. If they're preserving the bladder, they try to do a maximal uh, transurethral dissection of bladder tumor. And so you can see, like compared to the uro upper tract urothelial tumor and a bladder cancer, lower tract urinary tumor, the treatment completely differs between the patients. And that's why it's very important. We pay attention to every aspect of the imaging and uh, we kind of contribute. This is how we contribute to the tumor board and the patient outcome. So radiologists have to be vigilant to subtle findings and look for possible or expected side of metastases. For example, in this patient, having a high upper tract tumor, he's had risk of having a lower tract tumor. And um, if the outside report, if they had paid a little attention to that bladder um, involvement, uh, the, um, the management would have highly deferred. And also make sure you have the satisfaction of search. Um, that has to start from your first area of training because looking at you, when you open a study and you see a very uh, big mass and or you know a malignant mass that they're following up, you don't want to stop there. You always assume there, there can be other findings and always make sure you do a systematic search pattern so that you don't miss subtle findings which can change patient's management. And also it is very, very important to compare with the prior reports, uh, especially in these patients or and also in the tumor boards because seeing the progression of lesion, sometimes it could be like a four millimeter nodule and it is not significant by measurement. Um, on the first study, but then when your patient can be gone and lost in the community and come, comes back like uh, five years later with a giant five centimeter mass, then you want to look back and see like, was it present before or not? 
which kind of changes treatment. If it's still like seven millimeter and four millimeter and like five years back, it shows a slow progression. It could be like a low grade tumor or a benign lesion. Whereas if it's like five centimeter, it's a high grade tumor or an aggressive tumor. So it's important to have a satisfaction of search and compare with the prior boards. Another case, a 61 year old male, he presented with hematuria like five years ago and he was treated with antibiotics, it resolved. And then um, nothing was done after that. And then now he comes with right hip pain. So um, as we expect, um, this patient had a hip radiograph and you can see there is like an irregular sclerosis and defor like a contour deformity of the uh, lesser trochanter. So they said, like, okay, let's, um, because of this, it, um, it looks more like a lesion rather than just a fracture healing. So they did an MRI and you can see there is irregular T1. This is an MRI of the pelvis T1 weighted sequence. And for bone lesions, T1 is very important to look for a true lesion uh, for a pathology. And you can see there is diffuse involvement of this um, right proximal femoral diaphysis that we are looking on the skin. And uh, there was an axial, this was an MSK protocol. So they were primarily looking for the uh, femoral lesion. And you can see like they did catch this lesion, but they also found a very large enhancing lesion in the prostate. It is not a dedicated MR uh, prostate protocol. So the first and second is if you have not rotated through MR, MR has like different protocols specific um, to those organs um, and sequences and like the uh, planes are different. And for prostate with the pyrats, um, you have specific uh, requests, uh, like uh, uh, requisites, like you need a, a DWI of specific B values and you need a small field of use to look at the prostate. Um, so we don't have those on an MSK protocol because you're geared towards looking at the bones, but still you're seeing a large lesion. And then this patient had a bone scan because of this uh, uh, pelvic, le uh, the femoral lesion, they already ordered a bone scan and you can see it shows an intense uptake and few lesions on the contralateral iliac bone as well. The acetabulum is also involved. So this patient, then they checked the PSA on this patient. It was elevated. It was about 15 nanograms per ml. And then uh, they went ahead and did a biopsy. They did not do a dedicated prostate MR because the lesion was pretty big. They could target it um, based on just this uh, MRI. And the patient had a Gleason 4 plus 5 prostate car carcinoma. Uh, for the earlier residents, if you don't know what Gleason 4 plus 5 is, it's a pathological grading system. Uh, the 4 on the first number uh, means uh, what's the predominant type of uh, grade of tumor on the pathology and followed by after the plus is the second frequent type of uh, grade of tumor. So Gleason 4 plus 5 adds up to 9, which is a high grade tumor. So this patient was detected on this one. So just wanted to emphasize like attention on not to non-target findings on specific imaging protocols can help and save time in arriving at a diagnosis. Let's say if this patient um, on this prior image, if they did not catch this lesion, of course they would have seen um, on the bone scan, they would have ordered an MR prostate, come back for the prostate and then had a biopsy. Instead, like they picked up on this lesion on the MR MSK protocol and it kind of like saved some time for the patient's diagnosis. Um, so this is another case. It's a 59 year old male with history of right nephrectomy for uh, clear cell RCC one year back. So I'm just showing this is uh, the patient with the RCC. This was resected. And one year later, he comes with lower urinary tract symptoms. So what we see here is a large uh, for the first and second years, if you have not seen an MR prostate, this is a dedicated MR prostate with small field of view. And this is a, a coronal image um, and uh, showing like, sorry, this is an axial image showing um, prostate. This is the prostate and anterior to it is the bladder, uh, which is filled with urine that's T2 bright. And posteriorly, you see the rectum here. And the middle image on the top is the um, uh, DWI image and the right is the ABC image. And the bottom I'm showing, um, the left side is a T2 image, the middle is a post-contrast image, and the right bottom is the PET CT, which is the colorful images that we get. Um, so what we're seeing here is a large volume tumor. Uh, you have a tumor that's involving the entire right side of the peripheral zone and the transitional zone. Crossing the midline goes to the left anterior uh, peripheral zone. 
and shows corresponding restricted diffusion, which means malignancy. Um, and then the bottom image I'm trying to show, there was seminal vesicle involvement. You can see on the right side, the arrow mark shows towards the enhancing nodule, the um, involvement of the seminal vesicle. And PET-CT did catch that lesion as well. Um, and here again, I'm trying to show this. And then the right top image, here you can see there was a little bulge into the left posterior bladder wall. And you can see the prostate tumor that's growing across the midline is also involving the bladder wall. So this is all like um, in um, changes management in these patients. Having a seminal vesicle involvement or like even bladder involvement, all these change management of the patients rather than just an organ confined tumor of the prostate. Um, so I'll come back to the teaching point on that case after this few cases. So this is a patient with prostate MR. Um, and as I said, like the left top image is the T2-weighted axial image. And the middle one, which has the orange and the red line, shows the contour that we do, uh, which is sent to the urona, which is like an uh, ultrasound uh, like the uh, biopsy. Based on the MR, like we target, uh, we mark the contour for the lesion and the urologist do their biopsies in the office. And the bottom left and the middle images are the AD, uh, DWI and ADC image. And uh, the top right image here shows the post-contrast image, which has a early announcement of the lesion. And the bottom right image um, shows the whole gland prostate mount. Uh, where after a radical prostatectomy, they kind of slice the prostate and kind of map it uh, for the lesion that they see on pathology and also kind of like map it to the T2-weighted images to show where the tumor if they're matching. And we can see how much our contouring of the lesion, which we see on the prostate, matches with the pathology uh, um, contouring. Um, so just wanted to emphasize the fact that um, our MRI, like our images can correlate, highly correlate to the pathology and uh, radiologists play a very significant role in guiding biopsies and targeting the biopsy to the lesions. This is another patient. Um, he's a 73 year old male having a large tumor. Um, this is a central T2 hypointense lesion showing an announcement in this uh, middle post-contrast image. And um, ADC and the DW, this image on the right is the ADC shows restricted diffusion. The image on the top, I'm trying to show the seminal vesicle involvement again in this patient. So it's a large volume tumor, has some seminal vesicle in infiltration, sorry, uh, neurovascular bundle invasion on the left side. And this is the seminal vesicle infiltration. So pathology came back as Gleason 9, 5 plus 4, which is a very high grade tumor. So wh what I wanted to emphasize in these patients' cases are why seminal vesicle involvement is important in surgical planning. So Whenever a patient has a seminal vesicle infiltration, it is associated with local relapses, distant metastases, and local early biochemical recur recurrence. And that's why uh, it is of importance to the clinicians, like the urologist and like the oncologist when they're treating. Um, it's important for them to know, and you will see like they start discussing about, are we sure like their seminal vesicle infiltration? Because um, surgical planning changes, um, and also if they want to do um, uh, radiotherapy after a prostatectomy this, uh, depends on whether the seminal vesicle infiltration is present or not. And how does it occur? Uh, most common route of uh, infiltration to the seminal vesicle is through the soft tissues from between the prostate and the seminal vesicle, which is kind of direct extension. And uh, sometimes it can have a discontinuous metastasis, which is like prostate tumor will be in the posterior part and the seminal vesicle is involved, which means it's not a direct spread. Um, and then, or they can spread along the ejaculatory tract, which is very, very, very rare. Implications in management, as I said, if the patient has a seminal vesicle in invasion, though they do like removal of the radical prostatectomy with prostate and seminal vesicle removal, they will try to do EBRT, or, which is external beam radiotherapy, for local control following the prostatectomy because they had associated with early biochemical recurrence and distant metastases. Adjuvant or salvage radiation can also be done, but that depends on, on the trials and like the group practice, whether they, uh, they are comfortable doing it or like um, if, it, if they feel the outcomes are better. But EBRT is always done. Next case. Um, so this is a 66-year-old male, um, had a colonoscopy, a routine colonoscopy, 
and they found an ulcerated rectal mass, which was like uh, with a two centimeter polyp. And uh, the images on the left here, I'm trying to show where the polyp or the rectal mass was. Um, for the first and second years, the rectal MR has a very kind of similar protocol, but it's a different protocol from the prostate, but they ha do have the same small field of view, um, DWI and ADC. You can see like this patient, this is a sagittal T2 weighted image showing the mass in the rectum. And then this is the axial view showing the mass there. And this patient had an FTG PET, uh, which showed an increased focal uptake in the rectal tumor. And you might be wondering why I'm talking about a rectal tumor in a GU tumor board. So, so this patient, though they found all this lesion, they also picked up there is a lesion in the prostate. And this is the ADC that was done for the rectal tumor. And you can see there is a focal uh, restricted diffusion in, at the site of rectal tumor. And also there was a left peripheral zone and transitional zone lesion that was showing a restricted diffusion that we feel is significant and is pathologic. Uh, although the FTG PET did not show an uptake. So this patient did have the prostate biopsy and all the course that they took were positive and it was Gleason grade three, um, sorry, grade group three, which means I'll come to the Gleason grade group, which is a hybrid tumor. And this was not a direct extension of the uh, rectal tumor to this because you can see the rectal mass is along the posterior wall of the rectum, whereas the prostate lesion is in the anterior part of the uh, prostate. So it's not a direct extension or infiltrative tumor. These are separate primary tumors. So that's important when they are managing. So if you're going to the tumor board, they're going to ask you like, where exactly is the rectal tumor? Is it direct infiltration um, or is it a separate tumor? Because it makes a lot of difference for their management. Um, and then you can see um, the one caveat is um, it's a high grade tumor, but does not show an uptake because probably it's an FTG to, uh, PET CT. So in the GA tumor board, we said it's given the high grade and the extent of tumor that we are seeing here, um, we think it's a high grade tumor. It's not just getting picked up on the FTG PET. So do a PSMA PET, which is very sensitive for prostate uh, related metastases. Even like three millimeter nod nodes get picked up on PSMA. So we said like do a PSMA PET. So that's how like radiologists play a role saying like, you don't say like, oh, the PET is not picking up. Maybe it's not a high grade tumor. No, like we correlate with all the imaging findings, the morphology, pathology. And then we say like, probably the FTG PET is not the ideal one, do a PSMA PET. So just wanted to uh, give an overview for our, uh, the residents. Uh, what does a Gleason score mean and what's a Gleason grade group mean? Um, so, a Gleason score less than three, which is three plus three tumors are kind of, uh, sometimes the Gleason three plus three is called as a clinically, uh, not a clinically significant tumor. And a lot of these less than six or six or six less than six Gleason scores are put on active surveillance depending on the patient's risk factors. So what is um, the criteria fall for a very low risk? Patients have less than a T1C tumor, score of six, PSA is less than 10 less than three core biopsies are positive or less than 50% cancer in any core. And PSA density is less than 0 0.15. Um, for the early years, uh, PSA density is something we calculate based on the patient's PSA and the P prostate's volume. And anything more than 0 0.15, we kind of have a little higher suspicion. Your antennas go up thinking like, okay, I should be seeing a tumor, but not always. It's not a very uh, specific one or like not a very sensitive one, but you can still um, kind of have a scrutinization, a second look, seeing if you're missing any tiny little tumor. What are the low risk ones are like T1 and T2A, Gleason score of six, PSA of less than 10. All these very low risk and low risk are Gleason score six and the grade group one. Intermediate risk um, are differing patterns of the T staging, Gleason score and PSA levels, but they are technically seven. But you can see here, though it's an intermediate risk, they are kind of separated into Gleason three plus four, which is predominant uh, three grade uh, over four, and then predominant four grade tumor and three. So three plus four is a favorable risk, favorable tumors, whereas four plus three is an unfavorable tumor. And then they kind of separate them and say it's grade group two and three. As I said in this previous patient, he was grade group three, which means he's an unfavorable tumor with the 
Gleason 7, 4 plus 3. And high risk tumors are Gleason 8 or 9 and 7, uh, 9 to 10. So this is how they kind of group because in clinically, uh, it kind of talks a common language for the clinicians to understand whether it's a low risk, is it a favorable tumor, unfavorable tumor, um, all those risk factors. So coming to these incidental prostate ca cancers, because we saw the pro incident prostate was not the presenting finding, the rectal was the finding, and then they incidentally found the prostate. So about 5 to 14% of uh, patients undergoing procedure or surgery for BPH have prostate cancer focus, which is incidentally detected. That's the most common procedure where they found, like, yes, colonoscopy, like, or rectal cancer or any other pelvis imaging can also find them. But the, the number of MR pelvis that you perform in a male um, is less um, other than for pro direct prostate investigations. So the common procedure when you find the incidental prostate cancer is like the uh, TURP or the whole procedures. It's about 5 to 14%. So it's related to the age and PSA levels. For example, if a patient is more than 60 years and has a PSA level more than 4, then they have a higher risk of hands having an incidental prostate cancer. Why this is like, because patients having BPH will also have an elevated PSA, but if it's more than four, then you're having a risk of having an incidental prostate cancer. And management of these tumors are debated, like depending on what the Gleason score is and other things, like they kind of debate whether it should be just followed up or should you aggressively manage. So what you do is like expectant chance of having a residual disease or clinical progression PSA levels before and after TURP or whole procedures, and what's the Gleason score and tumor characteristics on pathology and the life expectancy. Based on all these, the team decides whether they should aggressively go ahead chasing the tumor or they should just put them on active surveillance. So what's uh, when, when do they do active surveillance? If the PSA density is, it's the density, not the PSA level, but it's both the PSA density uh, less than 0 0.08 after TURP and an indistinguishable tumor on MRI. So if they do a TURP um, BT and they found like pathology finds a tumor, then they send them for MR prostate. And if you don't see any tumor on them, they can go for active surveillance. Um, or the patient has a well-differentiated cancer with a limited life expectancy and a low PSA. Those can go on active surveillance and other things very similar. Um, so radical prostatectomy in these incidental tumors are recommended when the patient has a T1B cancer and a life expectancy more than 10 years because they have a risk of having metastases or recurrence. So they try to do a radical prostatectomy. And uh, the American Urology Association guideline uh, mentions they can go for brachytherapy, EBRT, which is external beam radiotherapy, and or radical prostatectomy if they have a low risk for cancer. Um, the other thing is like prostate metastases from recurrent rectal cancer. So this patient had a rectal cancer and you can see the rectum has been resected. There's an anterior um, perineal resection and patient also had a pelvic radiation. You can see all this fibrosis around here. And then this patient came back for a follow-up because of some pelvic pain. And you can see this is a post-contrast images of the pelvis. And you can see all this is infiltrative tumor involving the uh, prostate, entire prostate. And you can see the blue arrows like showing the pubic symphysis involvement, bulbospongiosis or the uh, penile shaft involvement. And you can see here, the muscles are also infiltrated. Um, so this patient has rec recurrent rectal cancer with involvement of all these. It is not a primary prostate, but a recurrent rectal tumor. Can we be sure on imaging? No, we have to do a pathology like sampling of these masses and then come back with the diagnosis. And if the primary mass, if you still have a rectal mass and you have involvement of all these like um, prostate, um, bone and muscle involvement, it will be a T4B because this rectum has already been resected. It's considered a recurrent rectal cancer. So just briefly talking about what's the prostate cancer and rectal involvement. Because we know like, um, as you can see, the rectum and the prostate is like just next to each other. On multiple images, like, you know, on as you will see through the images, they're just next to each other, but you'll see a very thin fat plane. Why is it like when patients have a large volume prostate cancer still doesn't involve the rectum is because of the denon valerius fascia, which is like a capsule that kind of serves like a membrane barrier between the prostate and the rectum. So the um, 
direct spread to the rectum is very rare. But it can happen when it kind of breaches the fascia, but it's still rare. Um, <clears throat> though there is a pro the large volume prostate cancer, the most common involved organ is the bladder and the seminal vesicle. Rectum is less commonly involved, again, for the same reason. The routes of spread for a prostate cancer to the rectum is the infiltration of this fascia, as we said. Um, it can go through the lymphatic channel or seeding of the rectal tissue through the prostate biopsy tract. And uh, for the younger years, if you have not known, like the prostate is always biopsy through the transrectal route. So they put in a transrectal um, ultrasound probe and they direct the biopsy through the rectal wall. And if suppose, like, it's not common, but if they have a seeding of the prostate tumor in the rectal wall, then it can have infiltrative tumor there. Uh, so morphologic findings of the prostate and rectal cancer are very similar. So the risk of being misdiagnosed, let's say there's a large like 5, 10 centimeter tumor. If they're involving both the rectum and the prostate, the question comes about like, is it a primary rectum involving the prostate or the primary prostate involving the rectum because the management completely differs. For example, if it's a prostate cancer involving the rectum, patient will undergo surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, combination of all these therapies. But if it's a rectal tumor involving the prostate, patient will undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy to shrink the tumor and then undergo surgery. So the management completely differs depending on what the primary tumor is and what's the secondary involvement. So that's why it's important for you to like look what's the predominant bulk of the mass involving and if you can kind of lean towards where the primary organ of involvement is. Um, differentiation of like primary prostate cancer with rectal infiltration versus a primary rectal with prostate involvement, you have to have a high degree of clinical suspicion. Uh, for example, if a patient has a rectal or anal pain and has a low rectal mass, especially those with history of already had a history of prostate cancer, it's most likely a recurrent um, prostate cancer involving the rectum rather than having a primary rectal tumor. So your suspicion should be really high. So one uh, in those patients, you have to rule out a recurrent prostate cancer before you proceed with treating a patient for presumed rectal cancer. Uh, low threshold to do an endoscopic evaluation like doing a sigmoidoscopy, proctosigmoidoscopy, and biopsy in the lesion. Uh, correlation with like PSA and CEA levels can kind of lean towards one or the other, but not always PSA is elevated in prostate tumors. That's a caveat. So you have to like take them with a pinch of salt. And immunohistochemistry staining on pathology can kind of guide towards whether it's a GU-based tumor or a GI-based tumor. Just wanted to have an interlude if it was too intense. Um, so I just, this is, courtesy for the Twitter, um, because I found these jokes on the Twitter. So I thought like if people can enjoy. So I have a neurology joke, but honestly, I would, it would take a lot of nerve to tell it. And then I have an ENT joke, but I seem tongue tied. I just put this picture of this baby crying. I want to make sure like you guys are not crying, listening to my lecture. So continuing, uh, this is a 32 year old male with right scrotal swelling, did not have fever or pain as everyone knows, like any patient with scrotal swelling gets an ultrasound as the first imaging modality. And um, this patient, as you can see here, you have the testes here. And then there was another very heterogeneous hypoechoic lesion, and it had a lot of vascularity within. It was seen kind of deforming the testis. So they call it as like a solid appearing lesion that's arising from or adjacent to the testis concerning for a malignancy, because uh, testicular tumors are uh, testicular appendage tumors are common in this age group. So urology was consulted and they ordered a CT for a metastatic workup, assuming it was a testicular-based tumor. The interesting part was um, the, pa the patient got the CT. Um, the initial CT, uh, they said like there were like tiny little um, le um, nodes in the uh, aortic cable region and the left paraaortic nodes, but not... Um, called to be a adenopathy based on the size criteria um, because they were assuming it's a testicular tumor. Um, so any testicular tumor, one of the, the other, one of the first sites of metastasis is through the lymph nodes. They can have uh, lymph nodes in the iliac or the paraortic region. So they were thinking this is assuming this was a testicular tumor. What they missed to see was there was a hypo uh, dense lesion in the left side of the prostate. And also this patient, uh, you can see partially like this is the part of the mass that we're seeing here. This is like some hydrocele, and then this mass kind of looks more cystic with like an unseen wall, as opposed to what you're seeing on ultrasound, where it looked like more solid. And the uh, follow-up, like in the patient was prepped for surgery, and the 
the, on the day of surgery, the nurse in the pre-op uh, station, they were kind of like trying to clean the patients. And as they were cleaning with betadine, uh, pus started pouring out. And so the urologist called from the OR and they were asking like, there is pus coming out. We assumed it's a solid mass. Can you look at the imaging again? And then we looked at it and you can see like this, these two lesions were like meso and some more history. So this patient um, was uh, from India. He's an immigrant. And then um, we said, okay, like test the pus, like, you know, give, being coming from an Indian uh, background uh, where TB is very prevalent, test for AFB. And they sent it for cultures, like all the bacterial aerobic, anaerobic, and uh, um, AFB staining. It was positive. So this was a tuberculous involvement of the scrotal um, uh, tissues and also involvement of the prostate by the tuberculosis. And these nodes were all related to this tuberculosis rather than a malignancy. So the patient did end up having an archaeotomy because there was extensive uh, uh, inflammation and infection. So patient had like uh, the cavity, the abscess cavity was very adherent to the testis and they couldn't kind of um, uh, peel it off from the testis. So they did do an archaeotomy and the patient was started on ATD. So when we see one imaging and you uh, come back and have another imaging, don't, um, um, it's always um, nice to look at the prior report, but also use your discretion to look at the images and have an open mind before you kind of like lean towards the same etiology. You can find some other etiology when you're kind of reading the studies. So that's about this patient. So prostate tuberculosis, um, it's the same mycobacterium. On the GU tube TB, apart from the extra pulmonary, is like seen in five to ten percent of of those five to ten. Prostate um, is six point six percent, and scrotal sac is three. Uh, so we can see like it's a very very rare occurrence in these uh, places, but it can happen. So having at least a knowledge about how it appears is important for us to like not not misdiagnose to be a malignancy. Imaging wise, they can present with hypo um, intense prostate nodules, um, but the thing is like they will not have restricted diffusion so much because it's a chronic granulomatous process. They do not have much of a restricted diffusion. That kind of gives you a clue on MR prostate. And they can also present as an abscess, like a well-defined fluid filled cavity, rim announcing one. Scrotal TB, they can, depending on what the organ is involved, if it's tested, they can have an enlarged hypoechoic testes, or they can have an epidermal or architis kind of an appearance. They can have thickened skin. They can have sinus tract or abscesses. Um, so differentiating, um, just uh, trying to show like how to differentiate a prostatitis from a prostate cancer. So this is like a T2 weighted image uh, showing like diffuse, to define like a wedge shaped hypo intensity and not much of a restricted diffusion in these images. And you can see this is showing like uniform enhancement along with the rest of the peripheral gland. So chronic prostatitis is the second most common false positive finding on a biopsy. So commonly some, um, we call it as a lesion, though there's not much of an F, uh, ADC um, or restricted diffusion, but they can have very focal prostatitis. And we call it as a pyrazine lesion, but then the biopsy comes back as benign or like inflammatory cells. So it's the second most common false positive finding. So always remember when you have a hypointensity, look at the morphology, even if it's like really focal, um, see if it kind of correlates with the restricted diffusion or early announcement. Um, if it is not, then it's you can give a differential saying it could be prostatitis. In these patients, if you're like really not sure, um, if they don't want to do a biopsy, you can recommend saying like consider repeat MRI in six months and a lot of times they can resolve. Um, so this is a patient, um, um, another prostate MR. Um, I'm sorry, like for the early years, there's a lot of prostate MR because the bulk of the GU tumor board uh, happens with around the prostate. You will have a lot of like renal tumors as well. But most of them, like, you know, when they're large and they kind of go for surgery, they do get discussed, but most of them are surgery. Only when they have a question about like metastases or like uh, some other uh, surgical planning questions, they come to the tumor board. Most of them are like usually prostate. So I just wanted to show some prostate ones. So you can see the patient's PSA level is just marginally increased, like 4.8. The volume is not too um, uh, impressive. 
And the PSA density is only 0 0.08. As you remember, if it's more than 0 0.15 is when we think it's like there's risk. But you can see here, it's a large volume tumor. There's like involvement of the right and the left peripheral zone. There's extra prostatic extension, involvement of the neurovascular bundle. You can see this mass is all enhancing. And, but it's PSA density 0 0.08. So always take it with a pinch of salt and like look at the images rather than just by the numbers. So the 4.2 centimeter, it's a Pirates 5 lesion. And also this patient had um, an external iliac slash obturator lymph node and also an internal iliac lymph node. <clears throat> so why the nodal disease is important in surgical planning is because uh, lymph nodal metastases is a sign of poor prognosis. It doesn't affect the patient's like uh, long-term, like it doesn't affect the survival per se, but it's a sign of poor prognosis rather than having just an organ confined tumor within the prostate alone. When do you say it's a regional versus a distant metastasis? So the regional metastasis, like you can see in this line, this is a great radiographics article if anyone is interested. Uh, you can read up about the lymph nodal stations and how it occurs. So you can see the line, which is um, be, uh, below the level of common iliac artery bifurcation. So anything that's below the common iliac artery, not the aortic, but the common iliac artery bifurcation is considered regional lymph nodes for the uh, prostate. Anything above the common iliac node or above, like the retroperitoneum left paraortic, all those are considered distant metastases. And um, six, five to 12% of the prostate cancers with organ confined tumors can have regional metastases. If it's extended beyond the prostate, then yes, you will have more lymph node metastases. When uh, you see the report, they say like radical prostatectomy with pelvic lymph node dissection, PLND. What it means is like they are removing the external iliac, obturator, and the hypogastric nodes. So which is like external iliac, the obturator nodes, um, and the hypogastric nodes. The internal iliac nodes are usually not removed unless they are involved. So if you're reading an MR prostate and you you're confident there's an internal iliac node that's involved, uh, remember to mention it specifically because that changes management. How? Because like after, apart from doing a radical prostatectomy, uh, if they know ahead of surgery, they will kind of remove the internal iliac nodes as well. If not, if they're not removed, the patient has to go for a focal uh, radiation therapy to ablate that uh, uh, lymph node because they want to have a local control. So that's how that's why it's important to mention those nodes that are not in the regional or distant metastatic nodes. Um, so wanted to kind of emphasize another one. Uh, if you're reading MR prostates on a regular basis, anterior lesions are sometimes missed. Um, just wanted to show here how uh, there's a very focal restricted diffusion, which is not so apparent on the T2 weighted images. And we had a correlate on the pathology as well. Why it's important to mention, even if uh, like I personally kind of uh, have a lower threshold to call the anterior lesions, uh, on an MR because the pyrads is not technically saying what's the grade of tumor. It's only telling us, telling the clinicians I have a high suspicion or a bar intermediate suspicion for a tumor. So when the when I know if the patient is going for a biopsy, if they're going for a systematic biopsy, the number of samples that are taken in the anterior part of the prostate is low, like fewer number compared to the peripheral zone because the prostate biopsy needle is guided from the rectum, transrectal, and for them to reach to the anterior prostate is hard compared to the posterior prostate. So if you have like, even if your suspicion is like intermediate, I try to give it as a lesion so they can target the biopsy. If I'm absolutely sure it's benign, then it's fine. But if I'm like kind of, I'm not sure if it's benign, I still call it as a lesion so that at least they can biopsy and then call it negative. So always like remember anterior prostate lesions are difficult to biopsy. So if you see something, just call. Um, I think uh, we're kind of running out of time. Let me see if I can skip to some more cases. Um, so this is a 68-year-old male. You can see the pro the PSA is not elevated. It's a normal um, within the normal range. And the prostate volume is large because he has a giant prostate here. And the density, you can see it's like very low. It's 0 0.005. And the mass here is like very heterogeneous, solid, and has some cystic necrotic areas, um, some enhancing septations as well. You can see some restricted diffusion along the solid parts, but a lot of cystic portions are there. Um, this, just by the morphology, uh, was called Pirates 5 because there was extra capsule extension, size of the mass, solid portions restricting. Um, there was a lymph node as well involved, but the bone scan was negative in this patient. 
So the pathology came back as high grade tumor. Um, you can see like high grade tumor, but a low PSA density and PSA. The reason is because the patient had a focal neuroendocrine differentiation. All the prostate cancers or almost all the cancers are prostatic adenocarcinomas, but there's been a trend in having neuroendocrine differentiation within the prostate tumors. And those tumors present with these kind of like larger sizes with cystic areas of necrosis and not much of a PSA elevation. So why these prostate neuroendocrine tumors is important for us to like at least know is because the pure, pure tumors, prostate neuroendocrine is very, very, it's like 0.5 to 2%. But they usually arise um, like de novo or like a, a lineage plasticity like induced by hormonal therapy, like which is kind of changing its cell biology um, in a patient who already had a prostate tumor. And it's usually associated with prostate cancer. That's the most common type. And they can be associated with men to be uh, syndrome as well. And um, they're usually negative for PSA and androgen receptors. And that's very important to know because just guiding by PSA, you might miss these tumors. And that's another reason why they get missed until they become larger sizes. Because as a screening, they only do PSA and PSA never gets elevated in these patients. And they get missed unless it becomes a large tumor, obstructive symptoms or infiltrative symptoms. Um, and these patients have like usually poor prognosis because of the median survival is one to two years since diagnosis, but they are very sensitive to chemotherapy and radiotherapy. As you can see, like though they are large tumors, the uh, prostatectomy is not mentioned as the first line treatment because of the neuroendocrine part of it. Um, large tumors, very heterogeneous, local invasion to the bladder and rectum can be present. They can present with lymphadenopathy, metastases to other organs can happen, and they usually present with lytic uh, bone metastases as opposed to sclerotic mets in a prostate adenocarcinomas. And um, on nuclear medicine, um, they, the regular uh, tumor, like if you do a regular PSMA PET or a FTG PET, they, there is possible you can get a false negative. There is a bombazine-like peptides, um, kind of uh, uh, peptides that are overexpressed in these tumors. And those um, Peptides are used as a tracer for the PET, which is kind of under research, but you can like search up and you will see them. I'm going to like uh, skip to some more, like um, probably the towards the end. Um, I'll show you one, a few more cases, uh, quick cases for how we uh, um, change the surgical and histologic feedback. So this is a, a patient who had a large bladder involvement patient actually came back with the came with the back pain had a ct abdomen and pelvis and you can see multiple sclerotic and lytic metastases in the bone and you can also see a large bladder involvement prostate was not very impressive not too large nothing impressive about the announcement pattern but had like you can see joint bilateral pelvic lymph nodes so this patient had um the, it was easier for them to biopsy the lymph node so they biopsy this lymph node and uh, the, this came back as a metastatic prostate cancer. And the initial pathology, when they did the TURB, um, they came back as urothelial cancer. And then they went back and did some extra staining because this lymph node came back as met ma metastatic prostate. And then they changed the pathology of the bladder as prostate, uh, metastatic prostate cancer involved in the bladder. Um, so this is another, and the same patient showing like stencil retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy and the bone metastases. So this patient had a castration sensitive prostate cancer with a high volume disease. So they put him on ADT and hormonal therapy. So not always a prostate has to be biopsied. Even if a, a metastatic lesion has been biopsied and comes back as prostate primary, they go ahead and treat the patient. They don't have to do a prostate biopsy. Uh, for better interaction, I just want to show like how you can change, have an impact on the GU tumor boards. You can see there is like on the prostate MR, not much of an impressive, but you can see an asymmetrically smaller left side peripheral zone, some ill-defined like small little uh, uh, ditzels, like early announcements, small focus of uh, restricted diffusion. But on the uh, PSMA PET, you can see like a very well-defined uh, focus of uptake and it's a larger lesion compared to the MR prostate. So these are lesions which you can say like, be confident and say like, I am confident based on the imaging pattern, it is a tumor, and then they can like biopsy them. Um, like how our impact on GU tumor board is like, this is another patient who had a prostatectomy. Post-prostatectomy, he had large hematomas in the pelvis. 
And then you can see this is a large bladder, uh, anterior to the bladder, there's a hematoma. Went on to have like, became an abscess. They put in a drain. Unfortunately, they put the drain in the larger collection, assuming this was connected, but it was not. And this patient started complaining of inability to walk, severe right groin pain. And this patient, this right pelvic sidewall abscess was compressing the obturator foramen. Because when the urologist called, they were planning to get a right hip MR. But then we said like, no, you should be getting a right um, pelvis MR with this specific protocol rather than just a hip, right hip. And then it kind of served the purpose. So you can, the radiologist can guide the clinician in placing the correct order. I'm going to stop here. If anyone has questions, I can take it. I had only a couple more. And uh, thanks to AUR and University of Utah for helping me with this. Yes, absolutely. That was fantastic. I selfishly um, was very fascinated by your discussion. I love that TB case. That was a, a great case. Um, I think you really touched on how being thoughtful and thorough in imaging review really can be useful for us in the reading room, but especially in um, anticipation of these more complicated cases and really kind of thinking out of the box. So I think that was excellent and really universal across specialties. I know we have some faculty who are not body radiologists on board, but that really those lessons hit home for sure. Um, I'm wondering how your institution handles outside overreads or kind of outside imaging that they that clinicians want reviewed for tumor board. We just kind of like, we don't give a formal report because mm -hmm. we already have an overwhelming volume. So we said like no to having a second read, official second read mm -hmm. to like review the images and like go over them. Uh, sometimes they'll just ask like, can you contour the prostate? That's a very common thing. They'll ask just mm -hmm. to contour and they'll biopsy it. And if I see additional lesions, I just make a phone call and say like, I do see additional lesions. I want to contour them. Are you okay with, because they get confused because like the report, they kind of check with the report and like, it's only saying one and you marked three. So I just make a phone call and say like, I am seeing three more or two more. And like, they, we go with that. Absolutely. I, um, it's always a challenge in preparing for these tumor boards. Um, there's an extra layer of complexity. I think when we have images that come out from an outside facility, sometimes you have access to those reports. Sometimes we don't. Um, and, you know, I think it is an opportunity for us to really make our mark um, on those patients that may not come through our system otherwise. Um, and then out of curiosity, do you, what type of academic time or protected time does, do you receive at your institution to prepare for tutor board? Um, I think it's a lot of effort yeah. um, to prepare and to prepare well. Obviously your entire talk demonstrates how useful that is, but it is a lot of effort to prepare. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, your institution's uh, practices? Yeah, we our tumor GU tumor board is on Thursdays at four thirty to five in the evening. Mm -hmm. um, so we get the Thursday afternoon off. Our schedule is usually half a day rotation. So like I'll be on CT morning, um, MRI afternoon kind of thing. So that afternoon I am given like tumor board preparation time. So the mm -hmm. entire like from twelve to one is our lunch time, but uh, like the one to four thirty is all my preparation time. I see, great. Kind of yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um. So again, I know it's a little bit difficult for uh, participant interaction just because we're not able to unmute, but if anybody has any last minute questions, we can throw those in the chat. Otherwise, I have put a survey uh, into the chat here for feedback. We would love both feedback from both trainees and from faculty, kind of getting multiple different perspectives. If you could just take um, a minute to fill that out for Dr. Jawahar, we will um, also try to send that out in an email for the residents. I know it's a little bit tricky because you guys are all in one room together. So can't just click on that link in the chat. Um, but I think we are right at the end of time. If nobody has any other questions, then, you know, thank you so much for coming and chatting with us. It was really excellent. I really, uh, personally enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who helped me with this coordination and accommodating me. Great. Well, and with that, I think we can um, call this a success. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.